Within the world of psychedelic music, for a wide range of reasons, there are a handful of figures that stand tall above the rest. But perhaps due to his impact on the early days of the style, perhaps due to his personality, or maybe just because of the fact there's so much lore and legend around the man, there may be no other more highly revered than the great Sid Barrett. Born Roger Keith Barrett in January of 1946 in Cambridge, England, before he was a teenager, Sid was already playing guitar and writing a few songs. In fact, legend says that after working to save money to buy his first guitar, he had to build his own amplifier because he couldn't afford both. Now, there are a number of stories as to exactly how Roger Keith Barrett became Sid Barrett, with some claiming that the nickname was actually an homage to an older local jazz bass player, some saying it was due to the style of a hat he wore, and a wide range of other myths. But one way or another, he earned the nickname before he was in high school, and it stuck with him nearly his entire life. In junior high, one of his teachers was a woman named Mary Waters, and he soon attended high school and played in a band with her son, Roger. Somewhere around 1963, Sid was in technical college, and he met a young man named David Gilmore. And while the two played a number of acoustic shows together, they really didn't seem to work out as a band, though this is where Sid really began his songwriting. It's well known that during these years, Sid became a huge fan of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and he soon moved to London, where he found a group of musicians to play with, with whom he would become best known. In their early days, this band was called Sigma Six, they were also called the Megadeths, and at one point they were even called the T-Set, but one evening they were playing a show and there was another band on the bill with the same name. So at the last minute, Sid renamed his band the Pink Floyd Sound, or some say it was the Pink Floyd Blues Band. This name would quickly be trimmed to The Pink Floyd, and eventually simply Pink Floyd. Over the next few years, the band recorded a number of acetates, though none of them really took off. And this is also when Sid began experimenting with LSD and hanging around with a number of visual artists, many of whom would become part of the Pink Floyd artistic and lighting team. The sound of Pink Floyd really changed in about 1967 when the group moved from covering R&B songs, and they started to just move into general reworkings and jam sessions of songs mostly attributed to Barrett. Then in October of 1966, the band went into the studio to record a number of demos, and it was here that you hear the first recording of a song called Interstellar Overdrive. And on that song, the amazing writing abilities both musically and lyrically of Sid Barrett became very clear. After using the demos to find a label, the band entered Abbey Road Studios in 1967. And while they were recording what would become Piper at the Gates of Dawn, the Beatles were actually in the studio next door recording Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Piper at the Gates of Dawn was released in August of that year, and it actually did quite well on the charts. And while the singles did get airplay, it was the non-single tracks that really pushed into the world of the psychedelic sound, completely redefining the genre. And even more than four decades later, a number of these songs remain absolutely iconic. The wild imagery and lyrics, as well as the unmistakable voice of Sid Barrett, continue to represent one of the extremes on the psychedelic spectrum. And many will argue that Sid Barrett's sound and approach remains the epitome of the psychedelic sound to this day. In the final years of the 1960s, Sid's use of LSD and other psychedelic drugs increased massively. And this caused him to miss a number of shows, as well as become rather unpredictable on stage. And he notoriously played a number of shows where he'd only play a single chord on stage, or simply walk around mumbling for a majority of the set. In early 1968, David Gilmore was actually called in to play a number of the songs because Barrett just couldn't get it together on a regular basis. And as his condition worsened, Gilmore's place in the band became more permanent. This general unpredictability and unreliability led to Pink Floyd letting Sid go in 1968, and this would be the catalyst for Pink Floyd's next massive shift in terms of their sonic approach. Post-Pink Floyd, Sid did release a number of solo records, most of which have gained an absolute cult-like status over the years, and this is where his true love for the blues really shined most clearly. But even in support of these albums, Sid only played one or two shows over the next five years, and he became something beyond a recluse. And he would spend time in mental institutions before virtually disappearing from everyone he knew for almost 40 years. In the late 1970s, Sid moved back into his mother's house in Cambridge, and save a few weeks here and there, he remained there for the rest of his life. The fact that he was so rarely seen led to countless myths about what he had done, what had happened to him, and where he was. And throughout the 80s, Sid Barrett became an absolute cult figure. In June of 2006, Barrett passed away of pancreatic cancer. And while that ended his literal life, it did nothing but add even more to his legendary status. Perhaps the greatest legend of both Sid Barrett's life, as well as in music myth history was when he turned up out of nowhere in a recording studio where Pink Floyd was recording the song that would eventually be called Shine On You Crazy Diamond. At the time, Barrett hadn't seen the band in years, and at first, many of them didn't even recognize who he was. Also, for those unaware, the song Shine On You Crazy Diamond was actually written about Sid Barrett. And aside from a one-off run-in with one of the band members a few years later, the fact of the matter is, the Shine On You Crazy Diamond sessions were actually the last time any member of Pink Floyd saw Sid Barrett alive until his life was over. So whether it was due to his massive, irreplaceable replaceable impact on the world of both psychedelic and pop music, his role in the creation, emergence, and progression of Pink Floyd, or simply the massive amount of lore that continues to surround his name to this day, there's simply nobody else in history that can claim a spot anywhere near the great Sid Barrett. Oh!